Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. The Lawyers on the Rocks are Jeremy Eldridge, me, Kurt Nachman, and Adam Crandall. We are produced by Gideon and Up Next Creative. Jeremy Eldridge practices Canadian Mountie <laughs> Law. Canadian I'm Kurt Maritime. Nachman. I'm teaching a civics class at Loyola <laughs> Blakefield High School today. And Adam Crandall is... Uh, not working again. Not working. And he was out on the Gordon's Fisherman boat this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a number of great topics. Um, we're going to touch base on the Alec Baldwin shooting. Um, we've got a bunch of great stories, but most importantly, and right off the top, we are drinking the Palawan punch. And if I'm saying that wrong, please correct me. And we are joined by chef Ray Eugenio of the heritage kitchen in Baltimore. Chef Ray, what's up? What's going on, gentlemen? Cheers. 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 There. Thank you so much for uh, for for joining us. We've been talking about this for a while, um, having you come on the show, and I really appreciate. It. I mean, you had to shut down the restaurant; you had to put the uh, "Gone Fishing" sign up yeah. to hide in in, their, in your office there to do this. We That's really right. appreciate it. No, no, I'm happy to be. Here. I couldn't wait. I, I remember you telling me about it, and we, you know, every time we see each other, we talk about it from time to time. And uh, when you emailed me, I was like, "Yeah, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it." Well, I'm, I'm excited and we're so excited. Actually, we all ordered in lunch from the restaurant today. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, thank I you. have the itis like a motherfucker right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I should have had an espresso before this because I ate, we ate everything. Yeah. I mean, they're, everything. occasionally, most of the time, almost all the time, this might be the first, we have leftovers. Not we today. have no, no leftovers. No, no. In fact, <laughs> in fact, before Kurt got back, we almost ate all of his dumplings. That's how good the food was. Yeah. And then we would have been like, oh, Ray fucked up. He <laughs> forgot your dumplings. Sorry. That's great. So, so, so Ray, te- tell us tell us a little bit about yourself. Sort of uh, give us a little background. Where are you from? Where have you been? Uh, how'd you get sure. to Baltimore? Yeah. So, um, in short, uh, born in the Philippines. Uh, my father was in the Navy. Left the Philippines when I was about five. We uh, moved to Japan. Lived in Japan for about seven years. And then moved to Florida. Um, and then, um, you know, my career, culinary career started uh, actually in high school. When, uh, when I made a transition from junior high to high school, we had an option to go to a, Votex, a vocational trade school to learn a trade. Um, and a, a friend, my brother's friend, my older brother's friend said, you should take, uh, culinary arts. Cause it's real easy. You know? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. It was funny, right? Easy. Right. But he was kicked out of two other classes and he was put in culinary class to teach him some discipline. That's the part he didn't tell me. Yeah. Uh, so from there, you know, when I was, when I was going through that culinary classes there, you know, the instructors, they were like, oh, you're really good at this. You should pursue a career. So when I graduated high school, I enrolled in a, in a community college for a culinary arts program. And it was the first of its kind at the community college. Um, and then from there, you know, you know, I was just, I was thankful and I was, you know, glad that I, I was, I landed with the right chefs. Cause you know, at that time, and even till now, you know, I was living in Jacksonville, Florida, um, you know, at that time. And even now they're not really known for like fine dining cuisine or any kind of cuisine for that matter, except for like barbecue or things like that. Yeah. Gator. Uh, exactly. <laughs> gator nuggets. <laughs> yeah. Gator nuggets, gator soup. So, um, you know, again, you know, working with, uh, I worked at a barbecue place and then, uh, you know, then again, the people are, people I worked for, they just kind of led me in the right, uh, right places and the right people to work for. Mm. And then um, I did my internship with the Marriott. And then uh, the chef there, he was like, hey, you know, there's this guy coming in to open, uh, not to open, but to take over this private club in downtown Jacksonville. It's like, he's been on USA Culinary Olympic team. Mm. And there's such a thing. And they actually get the best of the chefs, you know, together and compete against other countries. And I worked with him and, uh, he was a guy that, you know, woke my ass up, like, Mm -hmm. like 
laid it out to me on what it's what it's going to take, you know, to be really good at the, in this industry, or if you wanted to be taken seriously. Right. Um, right. So I worked with him, and then he um, he actually took the the chef that I worked for that led me to him. Told him, hey, you know, my friend at the Ritz Carlton at Amelia Island's leaving. Wasn't sure if you were interested. So he took the job and we all followed him. Hmm. And then um, and then from there, I kind of moved around through all the different operations in the, at the hotel, uh, which I tell a lot of kids, you know, it's, uh, if you ever had a chance to go to a hotel, uh, you know, a, a reputable hotel, that's where you want to go. Because I say that because for me, you know, having the opportunity to see the different departments, like a three meal period restaurant, you know, the banquet service, the garbage service, the baking department, you know, and then the fine dining department, you know, kind of gave me an idea of where I wanted to be. So I ended up in fine dining where I worked for uh, Kenny Gilbert, who was one of my, one of my mentors. And, you know, I was, I still talk to him to this day and he has his own restaurants in Jacksonville, but, um, you know, it exposed me to a lot of things, you know, um, you know, like all the well, you high and, end. You yeah, and I have sort of talked about that some, how with the, you know, as a chef and as a, as a restaurant owner now, which we'll get to in a second, you know, that it's more than just the cooking. It's more than just the food that it's, it's the entire yeah. sort of dining experience. And so your background yeah. in, in hospitality yeah. certainly, you know, allows you to, to be able to do that now. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I mean, you know, I've never gotten asked a question when I opened this up. It's like, you know, and the question was like, you know, why have you waited this long, you know, to open up a place? Like, well, I never really put a, a timeline for me to open up a restaurant because I, I always like to see what's going on in the industry, you know, because obviously there's there's a big investment and a big risk, an even bigger risk, you know, sure. when you open up a different place. So I always like, you know, kind of kept an eye or kept my ear open on the industry. And, you know, I was always methodical about what I wanted to do, where I wanted to do it. Um, you know, so when I, when I, after I left the risk, we, we opened up a club, a private club down in Naples, Florida, and the entire executive board was all former Ritz uh, management, you know, from the GM to the CFO, to the, to obviously to the chef, to the um, food and beverage director. And then from there I left, I went, I moved back to Jacksonville and the guy Roy Yamaguchi opened up a restaurant there. And I, so I tried it out and then three months, this was in 2003, three months after I started there, that big storm came through here and mm -hmm. flooded the entire, you know, Inner Harbor area, Phillips Point. And then yeah. they had got rid of the, yeah, they had gotten rid of their chef and they asked me to come up here with a couple of other guys to help train some people, you know, and that's where I met Roy and his right hand man. And they asked me um, what I was looking for for the company. And I was like, well, I want to go West Coast. And they said, well, you come up here for a year, help them build the restaurant. At that time, the restaurant was like two years old. You're talking about Roy's that used to be over in Harbor East, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so like, all right, well, I'll come up here for a year. And they're like, yeah, come up here for a year. We'll send you wherever you want to go, you know? And so I came up here in 04, you know, and 17 year, years later, <laughs> you know, here I, am. I met my wife. I met my, you know, Juliet at Roy's and, uh, you know, we had three beautiful boys, um, you know, and I was there for just under seven years. And then I, um, you know, kind of filled it around a little bit. You know, I was going to move back to Florida. Um, opened up some concept there with my former chef. Um, and then um, an opportunity came up. I opened up Uzo Bay. Okay. You know, and, you know, I was there just for under under two years, you know. And then I uh, did some consulting for my buddy's friend uh, restaurant. Um, he was actually our corporate sh sushi chef when I was at Roy's. And um, give me one second. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the life of a restauranter always working man yeah. thank you okay okay great thank you um 
So, uh, you know, my, my buddy, he was uh, so polite, by the way. You're very polite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> gotta be are you a, polite gotta be in the kitchen, to too? Because most of the shit I said, are you are you polite in the kitchen, too? Because most of the chefs that I know are not. <laughs> well, I, I am. You know, I've matured a little bit. <laughs> but you know honestly when, when it comes to the food like i have a kid that helps me once in a while but when it comes to the food you know that's when i uh yeah that's when i really you know when that's when i rip people you know, I mean, that's, that's my product you know i mean that's that's yeah. what i'm presenting to the guests that's what they're paying for absolutely you know um yeah so yeah, so I consulted for my buddy's restaurant. So it's a, it was called Bocce Burger. He actually had five units. He had three in Vegas uh, and two in California. One was in downtown LA and one was in Pasadena. Um, and then um, and in, even in between then, um, I was uh, a good buddy of mine who I have uh, known for over 20 years. He's actually one of my mentors as well. He was uh, Oprah Winfrey's private chef. So at any time she had a big event, you know, he would call. There was like five of us that we all worked together at the Ritz Crawl. He would call us, you know, we'd fly to Maui, you know, or Santa Barbara, you know, or other places where she was going to have a party. And, uh, you know, we'd go over there and just, you know, just, you know, represent pretty much. Um, so I did that. That sounds horrible. <laughs> and so how many babies <laughs> did you have with Oprah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I my mean, wife might be listening on this. <laughs> no, no, just, does Oprah own any of the restaurants? No, yeah. I mean, it's fun. It's so funny, Ray, because you just kind of, you almost yada yada the fact that you were the private chef for Oprah Winfrey. That's why I, I had to stop him because yeah. he like, he was like the opposite of name dropping. Yeah. <laughs> like you almost just kind of blew right through that. And I knew Jeremy wasn't going to let you do that. We were going to have to circle yeah. back on that. That is fucking yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, it was it was, it was, it was really cool. It was a great opportunity. And, um, I, I'll be honest. I mean, we, um, you know, what the guys that I did it with, you know, I mean, we were always serious about food, you know, and especially, you know, with some event like this, you know, I mean, when you have the first event I did was for Michelle Obama's 50th birthday. Right. This, and, this motherfucker right here. Is this I how I know that. Is this how I sound when I talk? And I mean, I don't even know cool people. I was going to say the difference is that the people that you he actually, name drop aren't aren't really aren't as good as him yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 no it was really cool you know another another event i did was at her home at in santa barbara and it, you know i mean you guys can't imagine like her property like it's ridiculous you know? i mean she has like a rose garden or like a, a citrus garden that's bigger than most houses <laughs> in in the city itself it's just ridiculous um so there was one event that we did just my buddy and i it was for mother's day and then the following day, we're we're cooking lunch, and you're like, "Oh, Miss Winfrey's gonna have a guest, right?" And then the Mother's Day event, like Pharrell was there and his family, Ben Affleck, you know, and some of the local celebrities there. And then, uh, so we're cooking lunch the following day, and here comes Miss Winfrey walking in. It's like, chefs, I want you to meet Miss Alicia Keys. You know, she comes walking in the kitchen, right? Really, you know. Really cool, you know, like you know, when you're just cooking, and then here's Alicia Keys, you know, walking in the kitchen, you know, shaking your hand, giving you a hug and stuff. You know, <laughs> do you get nervous when you're cooking? Because I mean, I have a big no. crush on Alicia Keys. I'm not gonna lie. Do you get a little nervous when like someone? <laughs> I don't know who you're, because you're not really salivating, you know, over <laughs> over anyone. You're I mean, Michelle Obama. I'm I'm into powerful women, so I don't mind yeah. admitting that. That's why I'm no, married my wife. I, mean, I love you, baby. As far as <laughs> The far as I mean, as far as nervous, you know, I mean, just I guess just like with any other regular guest that has your product, you know, you're just wondering if they're gonna like it, you know, because you know I never know, you know, guests will usually tell me you'll come or I'll go visit the guests and tell them how was everything. They'll tell me if they you know they enjoyed it, you know. In the, in this case, you know, it's not like we can just barge in, you know, our dining room and say, hey, how was everything? Right. <laughs> was everything to your liking tonight, Mrs. Ms. Winfrey? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and Madam Madam First, uh, Ma yeah, Madam First. Lady. I feel like exactly. I feel like she's going to tell you if she doesn't like it, though. Michelle Obama would have beat his ass if she didn't like it. <laughs> so would have Alicia Keys. Oprah would have yeah, locked she... him in her basement. <laughs> yeah, no, Michelle Mich Michelle Obama was the nicest. Oh my gosh, mm. she was the nicest. You know, and all, and all her, um, you know, her executive committee was all always around her. Mm. You know, so by 
about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, around Christmas time, it was the last time I, I did it in Hawaii for for Oprah. And, um, you know, obviously we had to sign all these agreements, right? NDAs and all that. And I remember the night we were cooking, or after we were cooking, Oprah Winfrey calls us, all of us in the kitchen. And it was like, we have some really very important guests coming in tomorrow. And I know you guys signed all the agreements, but this one's got to be real, really hush, hush. Wait, right? a- as your lawyer, Ray, is that NDA yeah. still in effect? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess so. You know, <laughs> Don't worry, Michelle it, it, Obama's I'm, not listening. Yeah. She's not one well, of our followers. The, 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 yeah, this, these, this couple was, was from somewhere else but uh, i mean people i was with you know they've they've announced it but um yeah it was uh prince harry and the oh, dutch wow. megan wow and her mom. yeah yeah so it was really cool this one she was still had the baby bump you know so um but yeah it was really cool really cool again the kindest people there um but yeah you know Hold on. does probably- that mean you were there when they did the 60 minutes when they i'm not the 60 minutes the oprah interview no, that was long you know after what? they had their child. Was it? Yeah. I think yeah. it was like during COVID. Yeah, no, like a year usually, and a half ago. Oh, COVID. Yeah, so usually she does like all these years. interviews at her property in Santa Barbara. That's where she usually does like all her interviews. I'm yeah, glad that her, you know her. that. And this is a good time to say thank you for being friends with Adam. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was gonna, I was gonna make a joke about Oprah doing her interviews at her estate in Santa Barbara. And Ray's in his utility closet. And we're sitting here in the corner of your yeah, office. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost yeah. the same, I'm sure. Hey, look, his hose is the decor. <laughs> so, yeah. all right. So, so Ray, I want, um, I do want you to get an opportunity. And I mean, yeah. I could, I could brag on Heritage Kitchen uh, yeah. till I'm blue in the face, but yeah. it's much better coming from you. So, yeah, Heritage sure. Kitchen, this is your, this is your spot. This is all yeah. you opened up, uh, I guess a little over a year ago. So yes. tell, tell our listeners, what's the, where are you? What's the concept? What's the inspiration? And, um, I'll tell them all the reasons why they should go there. <laughs> all right. Got it. So, uh, heritage kitchens, uh, we're, I'm located at uh, Whitehall mill market at 3300 Clipping mill road. Um, so the concept came about, um, actually this place came about a good friend of ours told us about it. Um, that they were opening up this market and they were get you know giving out really great incentives you know to to anyone that wants to move in and um so I took a look at it you know I had some had some questions um but then it all came about you know and then um and then covid hit <laughs> um, how convenient you know, I'll be honest for like three weeks you know I, I didn't know what the hell I would think you know, and then um, they asked me to the market, the actual market opened up in June of last year because uh, my my space was still being finished up. Uh, so they had the owner asked me if I could do pop ups, you know, and when I started doing the pop ups, I got a little bit more comfortable. And, I, you know, my vision started getting a lot clearer. You know, I knew where I had to make the changes because of COVID, because, uh, you know, because obviously everything that I had planned, that all got thrown out the window, yeah. you know, so for me. Um, what was important because of how we needed to operate with takeout stuff, my menu completely changed. You know, I mean, the adobo and stuff was still there, but, um, you know, um, I had to rethink everything. Um, I was just glad I didn't, you know, I didn't dump, you know, a lot more money into it, getting, you know, just to gear up for the opening, you know, pre, pre-COVID. Um, so I, I tell people, I feel like I w- it was easier for me to make the changes because I hadn't opened yet versus someone that was already in business. Yeah. Um, Is that now, are you saying you had to make those changes because of supply chain issues? No, you know, the supply chain issue didn't come in until, you know, until recently it was more so of, um, you know, staffing, mm. um, you know, cause I was going to do everything on China, you know, you know, um, you know, the food that I was going to do was a little bit more, uh, more detailed. Um, you know, so with the COVID thing, you know, with everything going on, takeout boxes, you know, after a year now, I was like, you know what, because I have two counter space, like my front counter, you know, will seat about, about 12 to 14 people. And plus my bar, I decided, you know what, I've done this takeout thing for a, for a year now. I was like, I'll just do, I'll continue to take out boxes out in the general seating area and I'll do China 
at my counters, you know, and I'll be able to offer, you know, you know, higher end or other, other options at my counter, you know, just to make it more special. Yeah. Um, you know, it eliminates me having to hire another body to go fetch a bunch of plates and stuff throughout the market yeah. itself. Yeah. You know, um, you know, talking about renting, you know, dishwashing machines and things like that. I was like, you know, you know, so during COVID, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to need that. You know, there's a lot of things that I, that I scratched off. Um, but anyways, you well, know, you had to adjust on the fly too, which is what's yeah. even crazier about it. I mean, yeah. I remember talking to you around that time and you guys were pretty much ready to go. And it was like, wait a minute, we're going in a totally yeah. different direction. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. So tell us about the food, because I know you've got a specific sort of, or not specific, but you've got sort of an inspiration for not just the food, but the name of the restaurant. So tell us about that. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, obviously, like, you know, every time I thought about opening up a restaurant, you know, what what the name was going to be, you know, and I knew it was going to be a Filipino inspired, a Filipino cuisine, uh, because it's something I've thought about throughout my career and all the places I've been in, you know, and everywhere I went, you know, there was some sort of uh, influence, you know, th- you know, that I was doing at that particular restaurant. I was like, oh, you know, I could do this. You know, it reminds me of this Filipino dish that I could do, you know. And um, a lot of the things that I'm making, you know, was uh, was like all memories from, you know, when my mom, growing up in my mom and dad's house, you know. So for me, um, what I tell people is like, I'm not trying to elevate I'm not trying to modernize, you know, I'm not trying to take the food to the next level. Uh, Cause for me, it's all about the flavor. You know, that's what, that's, what's going to remind, like, especially the old school Filipinos, what that dish is. All I'm doing is basically applying the experience that I gain throughout all the restaurants and applying it here, you know, that, whether that's a different technique, you know, or a different ingredient that would complement the dish itself. And that's all I'm doing. I mean, that adobo dish, when I wasn't working in restaurants, I was making it all the time. And I was making it different all the time. Because when you're cooking something, you know, it's cha- it's constantly changing. You know, flavors, texture, you know, all that. You know, so when I started doing pop-ups, you know, this that was like the testing ground for me, doing pop-ups. Mm-hmm. I'm like, let me test, let me do Filipino cuisine you know, at these pop-ups and then see how Baltimore reacts to it. You know, and thankfully, you know, they've, they've, They've loved it, you know. So, and that's where this came about, you know. And it's like I was, I was like 100 sure that's what I was gonna do. Yeah, you've got. You, I would say you've built a bit of a cult following because I remember early on, or you know, yeah. several years ago, going over to Suspended and Pig Town, and yeah. you know, they those guys had you in there all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, outside of Fad and Sonin with their food truck, I mean, yeah. and folks were always like lined up. Like they would come to that spot because they knew that you were going to be there doing your thing, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it was cool. Yeah. You know, and, and by doing that also is like, I learned, I learned a lot of things, you know, I, you know, I, I gained a lot of knowledge and a lot of options of what I could do, you know, like doing as suspended because it was all, you know, they had a policy that everything had to be vegan. That's right. You know? So everything I did was vegan. And, and the challenge with that is in a lot of Southeast Asian cooking, you know, you could have a vegetable dish, you know, but there's pieces of pork, salt pork or salted shrimp or dried shrimp as, as a flavor ingredient. You know, so I was like, shit, it's the same way in the Philippines. <laughs> you know, like, so what do I do if I take that out? And it's a big part of the dish. And funny enough, by just adding more garlic and onions, <laughs> it did the job. And the one thing I learned is like, you know, it's funny, like back in culinary school, they, they tell you, you know, it's like, you know, the, the, the star of your dish should be the, your protein, whatever that is. Everything else, the starch, the vegetable, the sauce, it, it just complements that, that, that protein. But doing suspended pop-up with, with everything being vegan, you know, I started making more like really robust sauces. Yeah, you know, to to make up for that loss of of salted shrimp, fermented shrimp, or you know, salt pork, and it worked out, and people yeah. were loving, it, you know. So that's why yeah. vegans all smell like garlic, right? 
<laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. Now we're going to get vegan hate mail. I know, right? But it'll be made of <laughs> vegan paper and... So, Pinterest. all right. So, so I know Ray, the next, I, I think the next step for you at heritage is to get the, get the bar up and yeah. running, which has been put on hold, I, I, you know, yeah. mostly because of COVID yeah. and I'm going to, I'm going to put in a pitch here. And I think everyone in this room will agree that the Palawan punch needs to be like number one on the menu. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, so tell, so you were telling us a little bit before we went on air, what are what are we drinking here? How did this come about? Tell the yeah. listeners what what we've got here. We'll do put we the recipe have more? Up. I know, right? Yeah. We, do, we do not. Yeah. Shit. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so this Palo <laughs> Punch came in collaboration with um, one of the owners from White Tea Company, who has a stall here at at uh, Whitehall Market. He's a great. He he makes great cocktails. So you know, we got together and it's like, hey, you know, let's make some cocktails. I want you know because. I'm thinking about some of the cocktails I want to be serving here at the bar. Um, you know, and he, he, he gave me this idea. He gave me the basic recipe basically for this punch. And then, and um, because he wasn't really familiar with a lot of ingredients that I use, you know, and I'm just looking at the recipe. And I'm like, you know what? You know, it seems like there's a lot of citrus in here. Like, what can we infuse some of the calamansi? You know, and then I ran into this, this calamansi syrup. You know, I was like, yeah, you, you know what? Instead of using just a you know basic simple syrup, you know, which works a lot in cocktails, like I have this calamansi syrup that we could use. And uh, for those yeah, that tell, don't tell know, us, calamansi, tell us what that is. What is calamansi yeah, so syrup? Calamansi itself is a citrus fruit that's like uh, you know it's they grow in like tropical areas. I say tropical areas. It's funny because a lot of the Filipino households in Florida they'll have a tree or two in in, in their backyard. Hmm. You know, so I don't know if you guys see these are these are calamansi citrus fruit. Okay. These are a little small. I got these <clears> from <throat> one of my guests who was growing it in house. So, oh, this right here. So this is still at a ripening stage. When they're ripe, they're like orange. Um, it's a little bit smaller than uh, when they're when they're full size. They're a little bit smaller than like key lime. Like and a, what I like tell a uh, size. Yeah. Yeah. And when I tell guests, as far as like when the flavor of it, when they're um, at the right ripeness, in this order, um, mandarin orange, lemon, and lime. So here's a, and there's a bunch of little seeds in them. Huh. Oh, that's cool. And in the Philippines, we use this a lot. Well, you know, we have a, a several noodle dishes that will squeeze that over. Um, I've made sorbets with this. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, yeah you know i mean uh yeah there's a lot of things i want to do with this um in in, in um in cocktails or you know, you know alcoholic beverages like even like a a version of a mo uh, a mimosa using this oh yeah oh, that's... yeah so uh yeah i mean uh you know i mean i'm not a, i'm not a mixologist you know i don't i know very little about you know the bar business you know i mean i i i participate and sit at bars you know i mean adam you know i drink i drink Bud light in the <laughs> bottle <laughs> he told us that yesterday in preparation and i swore to god he was lying <laughs> i know we well if i hadn't heard back from you uh with a recipe today ray i was gonna bring in a 32 pack or an 18 pack of, uh, of bud light and just throw it down yeah. in the middle of the room here <laughs> so this is getting do you have the picture can yeah, we, I was gonna uh, say, what is Palawan? Yes. So Palawan is is an island in the Philippines, which uh, oh, there we go. You know, the Philippine Islands is composed of over seven thousand islands. Um, it's a beautiful area. Um, you know, that's not really well known, but uh, you know, if you go into these uh, like travel magazines for like exotic places, this is one that's always makes it in the list. Um. Great surfing there. Um, you know, you can see the water crystal clear. Um, but I've never been there. It's on my bucket list, along with some several other places just like this in the Philippines. Um, you know, not only to see the beauty, but uh, you know, just to see the the, the local food. Um, we're we're we have the picture up now, um, and it looks it looks a lot like the Baltimore Inner Harbor. Yeah, the <laughs> water is the similar. Color. I can see the inspiration. <laughs> 
<laughs> there are no bodies in that water. That's why it doesn't have that that body flavor. That body punch gives it. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Ray. So real quick before we let you go, um, sure. tell when are the ribs things. coming back on the menu? Well, Jeremy <laughs> wants. To, yeah, Jeremy wants to know when the when the pork adobo is coming back. Oh, it's um, on. Oh, you got the, the pork? pork? Yeah, it's on. It's pork and, and yeah. yeah. And I, I chicken up. and pork ribs. <laughs> there we go. So tell the listeners when when are you open? How can they find you? Um, you know, online, Instagram, uh, sure. and when when can they come see you? Sure. So um, currently we're operating Wednesday through Sunday. Um, Wednesdays and Thursdays, uh, we're open 11 to 7. Fridays and Saturdays, 11 to 5. And then Sundays, 11 to, I'm sorry, Fridays and Saturdays, 11 to 8. And Sundays, 11 to 5. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other party question? Um, you're online. I, you have the, you're oh, posting yeah. the menu on Instagram, yes. I think. Yeah. So, like, what I tell first time guests that come here, so have, our menu is like eight or nine, sometimes 10 items. Half the menu is what I call guest favorites. You know, I'm not going to call them signature dishes or anything like that. Um, I call them guest favorites because they're dishes I started off with last October when I opened up officially. Um, and just guests just kept coming back for it. So they'll never come off the menu. The other half of the menu, I change like every two to three weeks. Okay. Uh, based on their popularity. Sometimes it's just one item. Uh, sometimes the entire half. A lot of times the entire half. Um, we, we always offer... Uh, if I can make anything gluten-free, I'll make it gluten-free. Um, we'll always offer vegan options also. Um, yeah, and then um, um, what else? Um, yeah, again, we're, we're located at the Whitehall Mill Market at 3300 Clipper Mill Road. Um, yeah. Everybody go eat. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us over Lawyers on the Rock. We, we'll just come have dinner with you. We're now. going back for dinner. Yeah, yeah right we'll, on. We'll take your entire countertop space tonight. Yeah, right on. Sounds great. Sounds great. Ray, thank you so much. Thanks yeah. so much, Chef. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Appreciate really it. Really appreciate it, man. Cheers. 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 Thank you. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You. I finished my drink. I finished my drink, too. It's gone. Good stuff. Take care, guys. See He's ya. got a thank full you. glass. Thanks, I want to go take his full glass. Okay, that sounded a little bit alcoholic y, but you this knew is, what I meant. It's, it's, it's one of the best drinks I've had on the show, period. So good. Yeah. There we go. This is so. It's tasty. Yeah. We got the. Should we, we, should we talk about it now? Oh, goodness. I feel like I'm, I want to like do it. To everything. Do, do it. it. So, um, mm, kudos to Ray and I forget the guy's name, but the guy from White Tea for creating a vodka drink that you I say. like. Because I'm, you all know or should by now that I'm not a fan of vodka. Um, this is awesome. Um, it it does remind me a little bit of like a grapefruit crush, but somehow mm. simultaneously sweeter and more bitter, and thus more delicious. It has more complexity to it, but the like the citrus comes out. I love the apérol in it. I've, I want to try it with the bitters that he uses, but like mm -hmm. all that balance together is just really nice. Clarissa, first of all, thank you for making one hell of a drink. Yeah. yeah I mean, you're, it. you're so much better of a bartender than Kurt was and <laughs> for following directions and being an amazing bartender. But no, to what to Gideon's point, I think you helped me sort of understand what I liked about it, which was normally when a drink is so sweet, it's dominated by the sweetness. But yeah. this this was sweet with depth yeah. and complexity, which is me just repeating the $2 words that you just said <laughs> to make myself feel like I could understand what I just drank. I mean, I, I could easily, I mean, the, you, you, it's sometimes you can have one sweet drink and then you sweet. don't want another. That's the problem, right? Yeah. The bitterness helps Agreed. cut that quite a bit. I could see people, some people who don't like sweet drinks being like, no, it's not for me, but it's, you yeah. know, it, it's really, I mean, when he said key lime, I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah, that's the calamansi. It's that, yeah. it's that sweetness with that, you know, that tart. tart Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that just smacks you, and it's but a good smack. Yeah, like not a bad smack. No, I could it's, see it in a slightly bigger glass. I could even see like a mint leaf or something like in a bigger. But this is a complete vacation drink. Like I could absolutely. see, absolutely, it. it's so good. Like you see the picture of that beach, and you're like, "Yep, I drink this there." <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent, totally. Well, and the tea blend, really quick, is a 
It's an iced blueberry basil rooibos. Rooibos. That was my second guess. Rooibos. I guessed the tea. Tea, <clears throat> which is an, a, an interesting blend. So it sounds like this is the listeners, the viewers, head to Whitehall Mill. Yeah, try this. That's for sure. So is Whitehall Mill market, it's like a market concept like our house or like... It's a little bit different. So it's interesting. Um, I've been up there a couple of times. There's so um, heritage sort of has like the the center spot, right? With like the as Ray described it, like a counter and a bar and then a dining area, mm-hmm. yeah. which right now is predominantly order at the counter and eat. I think that'll change as as we come out of COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, their um, suspended brewery has a stall there where they sell uh, um, bottle, you know, their uh, bottles um, that you can walk around in. Um, there's a bakery there, crust by Mac. There's a burger place, I think. Yep. But it's then there's also more like more, Mount Vernon Marketplace. But there's but a smaller. few more retail, retaily kind of places yeah. too. So it's not just food. Okay. Um, yep. So like the tea place, for example, there's kind of like a culinary gifts type place. Yep. I forget what it's called. Um, and there's also like an event space on one end. Mm. So um, you know, if you're if, people, organizations, places that can host events there as well. It's beautiful. And it seems like the whole thing is pretty much anchored by Chesapeake Oyster Company. True Chesapeake restaurant, yeah. Next to the market, but sort of a part of it and is a much larger restaurant space. Right. And for folks who are familiar with the area, it is, it's the mill building directly adjacent to where Biroteca is on Clipper Mill Road up there. So we should be doing huh. our next live okay. podcast there. We, we probably certainly should. could. We probably should. I'll be drinking these. <laughs> yep. Well, now we have the rest of the podcast to do, gentlemen. Now you've had one drink. Everyone looks like they need a nap. And, <laughs> until the next time, <laughs> sit back. <laughs> Professor Nachman, what's so, his top story? Yeah, I mean, the top story is great. We got to get into it because it's a really, really, really fascinating topic. It's a terrible, tragic incident. And for those who don't know, um, Alec Baldwin, the actor, um, for famously on 30 Rock, also at one point he was uh, Jack Ryan, one of the many Jack Ryans um, in Hunt for Red October. But Alec Baldwin was on the set of a movie called Rust, and he was practicing dry firing a revolver firearm and it went off and it killed uh helena how hutchins um the cinematographer and also wounded the director um and so you know the questions there's a lot of questions is someone going to get criminally charged what is the civil liability you know if someone's criminally charged sort of what does that look like um and, and so, you know, we have all of these questions, but I think I just want to start off and I'm just going to run through kind of some of the things that have happened that we are aware of at this point. Um, Rust assistant director David Halls said he picked up the gun and brought it over to the production's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez, who we'll get to, to be checked before resuming rehearsal the day of the fatal incident in Santa Fe, New Mexico, according to a search warrant filed to Santa Fe Magistrate Court. I check the barrel for obstructions. Most of the time, there's no live fire. Hannah opens the hatch, spins the drum, and I say cold gun on set. Hall told authorities. Hall says he recalls seeing only three rounds in the chamber. He said we should have checked. He should have checked all of them, but didn't. I couldn't recall if Hannah Gutierrez spun the drum, the warrant said. Hannah then was told to open the gun so she could see what was inside. David advised he could only remember seeing at least four dummy casings with the hole on one side and one without the hole. No charges have been filed yet related to the incident. Authorities were granted the warrant to search for a prop vehicle where firearms were allegedly stored during the production. Um, So basically, uh, from my understanding, there's like a rolling safe where they keep the, the firearms on set. And Jeremy, you've got some more information about this. Um, Hannah had admitted during lunch, the ammo was left on the cart on the set, not secured. She told authorities, however, that no live ammo is ever kept on the set. 
Uh, Sheriff Adon Mendoza said they recovered 500 rounds of ammunition, including a mix of blanks, dummy rounds, and what we are suspecting to be live rounds. Yeah. So I guess the big question is, where did they come from? So what I read in addition to this article was that <clears throat> there are some times that live rounds are used. And so if you're there filming a scene where an actor or actress is loading a firearm, they may use a dummy round or live round because you want the look of it is obviously they're marked differently. Mm. And so the idea was, and one of the concerns here was, was that gun to be used at a different time or, or a different stage of the filming to say, I'm going to load it. And that way, and there was a term for what that shot was called. And then that gun is immediately right after that, not only, um, you know, is the, is the projectile dislodged from the, taken out of the weapon, but then also the weapon is taken off set. So here it looks like there are a mixture of, what they're calling a cold gun with other prop guns, guns that maybe couldn't fire at all or rubber guns. And the biggest problem here right now is you have to have certifications. And that's why you are, your specialty is handling these firearms. We also have come to know that like half the crew quit the day before. So there were issues there's, there's already with the production, production. with Russ. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So this has been going, it's been, let's get, it's had COVID production delays, all kinds of stuff. So yeah. criminally, it's e I think it's easy to say, even though Alec Baldwin's the one that fired the weapon, there's almost impossibility in charging him. And there's not, there's just not a crime that fits unless they can prove that he knew. So because it's pretty obvious he didn't know, then it comes down to because this young lady was not only responsible for maintenance and storage of the weapons, but also handed him the weapon, then is it her and or the individual that the director, the director yeah. who who saw the gun, could that be something akin to as Kurt was talking that some that they have misdemeanor murder in some places or manslaughter, um, negligent homicide. Yeah. Different states have different variations of this lower level of a person being um, injured. So a lot of states, death. not including Maryland, have a negligent homicide statute where just simple negligence it usually carries you know three years, five years, something like that. Um, so it's sort of one below manslaughter um but you know so so the question with regard to manslaughter would be is this grossly negligent behavior it is a firearm i mean and it was literally her job to keep the set safe literally that's all her job was is to make sure that all the firearms were stored logged cataloged organized correctly so you literally have one fucking job and you miserably failed at it well, and the fact that the guns were left out, I think, speaks to how the production went. I don't think it has much to do with how she handled that particular gun on that particular day before giving it to Alec Baldwin. But I think it certainly sets the stage if you're talking about for just some level of recklessness, exactly, yeah. or for the for the negligent homicide mm -hmm. to say if your if your defense is going to be accident, right and it's going to be a little more difficult to get to that point because I think the rest of this stuff is could, could really gets you from negligence to gross negligence, right? Because it's, it's the entire, it's the totality of that situation. Right. So the other thing, and it's not mentioned in the show that the show note article that we'll link to, but if you follow the rabbit trail a little bit, and I've read some other stories, um, this young lady apparently had, and this is the armor, Hannah Gutierrez. Um, she apparently was like sort of a family legacy, in this industry and this is like sort of a thing you know it'd be like someone who does special effects and like their dad does special effects so her father is like a famous armor um for hollywood and she has been like under his tutelage however apparently she got fired from her last two jobs um for mishandling firearms and then this job the the production according to one of the articles that i read was rife with problems related to the firearms and it's a western right so it's not fucking John Wick, though. I mean, come on. Like if it was John Wick and you had like, you know, 40 fake Russian guys running around trying to kill Keanu Reeves with rubber guns and as they do the rubber guns, they do blanks. And I'd read a little bit about John Wick and sort of preparation for discussing this one, because that is like the ultimate shoot em up movie. That's not what this is. I mean, it's a Western, but it was you giving one gun to one person. It wasn't like 40 people in a scene. You know, it wasn't fucking tombstone. <laughs> It's interesting to me that in Hollywood, the person who is holding the firearm is not responsible for being aware 
because like when you take a gun yeah. safety class like gun safety 101 first of all always check and see if the firearm's loaded whenever someone hands you a gun even if they tell you that it's cleared unless you can see that the there's not a round chamber oh let's hold on real, real quick let's bring it to what we do for one second which is when we we watch so much body worn camera now right mm -hmm. the first thing that cops do when they recover guns oh, they clear it. is clear it. yep so and they're not even at risk for the gun going off. They're not putting, they're not putting wrapping their fingers around the trigger. They're not trying to dry fire it. But the first thing they do is they yell if they're seizing one is gun, 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 so that everyone around them knows there's a gun. Then and there's not even a risk of anyone else touching it. And then they they pop the magazine, they'll clear the slide. I mean, this is like very and I know those are cops and different, but arguably she it's has not. more training she's, she's and experience yeah. because her job is different. The cops are saying everyone around them knows how to handle a firearm. And I'm still doing, I'm still doing it this safe. She is the only person and the main person for that reason. And that's why they have those loud instructions that they do about cold guns. Gun cold, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so it, what's interesting to me is it, it's going to makes me wonder like how much stricter future regulation around firearms on movie sets is going to become, are they going to require actors to have, fire safety training are they going to allow actors to actually inspect guns before they fire them because then you also have this issue of it's it's no longer a like one person's job you have you you're suddenly introducing a another set of hands and potential change you know custody chain management there of the of the bullets Dude, if right? this shit so, happened on a rap video set the congress would already be meeting to like <laughs> find ways to to fucking prosecute rap video makers well, it happened and shit before remember yeah yeah the crow brandon lee yeah yeah brandon lee so well and that way i remember that. nothing happened right like, let's not forget that no one got prosecuted yeah you know at least right. to my knowledge nothing even happened to the person but didn't he die he, in that scene he like where, in the scene yes yeah yes. but it's the scene where like there's a million fucking bullets going off um, i believe he no, was killed he was with shot. a blank he was shot with a blank it it point blank, blank range, range. Oh, oh. so there is a part at the very end of the movie oh, yeah. where someone directly fires okay. around into him and he's actually killed in oh, that moment oh okay um, but I, I mean my point is no, i mean to get it yeah no i was gonna it bring doesn't happen thing. now i mean but that but happened fucking 30 happens. years ago but it fucking happens twice in 30 25 years years ago don't age us that much. 25 years ago okay <laughs> well, twice well, in 25 Adam, years we're not going to get congress no no I'm, I'm making i'm liking light of it because it's a it's a white guy western and not a not a not of a course. rap video but i think the second thing is you're also only hearing you're hearing about people dying as a result of right this. like you're not you have to wonder why she was fired from the other two movie sets you have to yeah. wonder yeah. whether other people have been injured or you know can we pull in and there's a photo can we pull it up gideon i feel this in is the, the only the part notes. that i feel bad for hannah gutierrez about yeah, no, it's in because notes, this is a little too easy like uno momento it's a little too easy um, yeah this I, is this is a little too easy is it low-hanging fruit this was about as low hanging this was kalamasi fruit <laughs> <laughs> I like how Ray, right? Ray's a fucking dude, man. Ray just popped that fruit open. Yeah. Pulled out his knife. He's like, I'm going to cut this fruit open. He's like, no, my boy's got a Kalamazi fruit tree. He's yeah. growing them inside. Oh, I don't think you're, I, I don't want to say this to you, Adam, but I, I just want to, like, I don't think you deserve Ray Eugenio. I mean, I like you a lot. You're one of my best friends. You're like, but I just don't know if you deserve someone that cool. Like, or maybe I'm just jealous because Kurt has a chef friend. You know, Kurt had Jason. He's got Ray. And I, I've, I've, no you chef. don't have any chef friends? Well, Jeremy Brooks, he's close, but he's uh, a retired chef and now a prosecutor. He's not Ray Eugenio. He doesn't cook for Oprah and Michelle Obama. True. All right, so we're we're pulling up this photo right now. And by the way, if anybody, all all seventeen thousand of our listeners, for anybody that's out there, we've uh, I'm monitoring the feed. Is there something wrong with the feed? No. Oh. <laughs> so there's the gun. gun. They can't see. It. Oh, they can't see it yet. Oh, this man. is I mean, good. Kurt and I have jinxed four times on this podcast. This is so good far. television, right? Yeah, here. this is great. Yeah. I mean, you could do something else. While you're waiting. All right. Well, <laughs> we're waiting for this uh, to pop up. <laughs> Let's run on to this week's episode of I can't. Wait, believe. you can't move to the next story. This is still part of the same story. The okay. The title of this next story is perfect. I'll back up. Who gets charged in this case? Ah, there we go. Honestly, I don't think anyone is going to get charged. I think she should be charged. But that assumes one very simple thing, that 
they have a negligent homicide statute, which is something that I didn't get to look up Research. beforehand, but almost every state has some variation of it. Right. So if what anyone's going to get charged, it's going to be her. What's the equivalent of negligent homicide in Maryland? Do we have that? We, we have manslaughter. 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 But it's that's gross, gross negligence. negligence. Yeah. So if you're if you're just this not, would have probably been right. I mean, there are other charges though, reckless endangerment. You know, there there yeah. are definitely other chart there are uh firearms offenses. Reckless you know, is what it, three years in, in Maryland? Five. 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 So I mean, it would probably be reckless, and then you might be you might see do we you know have, the, we have the, gap, up, the guidelines folks. would actually be calculated differently because it, even though it's a misdemeanor in Maryland for this would would have involved a weapon and had death. So you may not see probationary guidelines unlike you you normally would with most reckless endangerment cases. So this is the person that is responsible for firearm safety. It's a gr- okay. First of all, it's a great. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's a great spider tattoo. It's like a three D. Looks like it's coming out of her belly. I'm pretty sure she got that working on uh, Matrix Revolutions. I think my concern was her age. If we're going to make anything an issue out of her, if I, if I recall, she's 22. Am I incorrect? I believe she's 23, 20, something like that. She's very young. I think my biggest concern is, you know, is her age and relative inexperience. And maybe like you said, which I was unaware of riding on her father's coattails. Yeah. But at that age, being responsible for that many people's safety is a, I mean, it's, it's troubling. It's, it's truly for me, it's troubling. I mean, okay. So talking about civil liability, tremendous civil liability. I mean, the family of the, you know, and first of all, you know, what Alec Baldwin has to be going through right now, like nobody would wish yeah. any of that on him. And it would be interesting. Someone. Well, it would be interesting to me. He, to know he has a conviction. For what is the protocol? Him. What is the protocol in Hollywood? Do you know, in, and is this going to change where actors are like, I am checking every gun that some motherfucker hands me. There's probably time constraints. There are that's, probably that's what I was saying. But then, yeah. and then also the, the, like I said, the chain of custody issue, like then you open up the possibility that an actor could throw a live round in a gun if they're checking the guns. Right. And, and how do you verify that? And they could just say, oh, I got it from the armor. That seems like a real issue. No, I mean, I, I think you're going to see probably never know a bit more. Set. You're going to see probably a bit more regulation just probably within the industry. And then you'll see more experienced people, right? That they're not, people are probably not going to take risks, frankly, on individuals like her. Yep. And then you'll probably see a check and balance to make sure that there are two <clears throat> two armors, for instance, on the set at all times. I'll tell you what. And then a check see. and balance. I'll tell you exactly what you're going to see. No, nothing. More <laughs> rom coms. <laughs> Do you know what I like? Fewer westerns. I like, like rom coms. More uh, rom coms with revolvers. <laughs> those, those make it more interesting. We're going to see less violence in Hollywood, guys. There's too much criminal liability. I mean, I could do probably so in terms less, of civil liability. Though. I mean, the studio is going to pay out the ass. They're going to pay. And, oh, yeah. and knowing it, you know, they more likely than not, if they're smart, are going to just pay the family, give them some money, have them sign an NDA and be done with it. That's that's the right thing to do. It's what they should. I mean, do. they have insurance on these films as well. I mean, this is not going to be it's not going to be a question of if it's going to be a right. question of how much. Right. Yeah. A lot. Well, and, the, and the director's getting paid, too. Lot. It's not yeah. it's not just um helena it's going to be the the director and there's a lot of these people who have a lot of money you know at Mm -hmm. stake i mean alec baldwin i know he's had some troubles but mostly involving his wife pretending to be hispanic also if i I had to guess this movie will never be released based on everything that's happened so far and now this it's it's rusted it's (laughs) this movie is over Hmm. all right next topic this This is definitely a bbc article by the way we need a pattern Which when one? you go from a sad article. Like we should start one. with no, funny it was a Baltimore Sun article I mean, and end was... with sad. You can't go from, you know, Alec Baldwin <laughs> fucking kills somebody <laughs> directly to Thomas Steeman Beeman. <laughs> On this week's episode of I Can't Believe It's Not Quite Baltimore City, a man <laughs> who stabs a woman with semen filled syringe gets 10 years in the slammer. 10 where years. A church tin man be who stabbed a woman there. in the buttocks with a Too syringe soon. that was later discovered to be filled with semen was sentenced to 10 years in prison on Tuesday. Thomas Steeman <laughs> did the semen crime and was sentenced to 25 years in prison, suspending all but 10 
for first degree assault, five years in prison concurrent for second degree assault and five years of supervised probation. Steeman Seaman was caught on video February 2020, pulling something out of his pocket, bumping into a woman as she returned a shopping cart to the front of a church in grocery store. The woman jumps as if reacting as if pricked and Steeman returns the item to his pocket. She asked Steeman if he burned her with a cigarette. And he replied, yeah, it felt like a bee sting, didn't it? According to the police report. Like, I don't, what is the point of this? I mean, what, you mean I was talking about it? No, I think he's... No. I think he's <laughs> I, I, the, the big question we can come back to it is, and I don't know, and I think we may need to have like a doctor means on to explain this. What's like a the forensic pathology psych- of this? What is the pathology? What is the psychopathy of an individual who... who um, does this um there was there was the reason we're saying baltimore is this this did happen in baltimore with a guy walking to a grocery store with a shirt that said anything is possible in a hennessy bottle and then allegedly squirting women uh with semen as well but this happens pretty frequently it seems at least once or twice a year yeah yeah um so this is where it gets Here. more troubling. They identified the it man. It gets more troubling. It does. It, bad it does. The, the Anne Arundel County asked the public for information. An anonymous caller called in and I identified Steeman as the semen guy. Uh, police <laughs> obtained a search warrant and found a hypodermic syringe with an unknown cloudy liquid in his car. So he was going to do it again. They found the clothes Steeman semen wore during the attack in the back of his bathroom door after doing a search warrant in his house. They obtained his DNA and sent the liquid in the syringes to a lab for testing. The results came back identifying the liquid as semen that matched steaman. The p- <laughs> this is too easy. The pants that he wore that day also had a substance on them later to be determined to be steaman. No, steaman semen. <laughs> um, you know, sadly, though, the victim in this case had to take a 30 day cocktail of preventative medication Um before the police discovered the syringe was filled with semen, I presume that she would have had to have get AIDS tested and, yeah. and sexually transmitted disease tested. I mean, this would be a pretty horrific uh, psychologically uh, attack on on your person. Um, and and again, I think, you know, you and I have handled not this exact case, but things that are similar. Typically, what we do is we get a, a mental health professional involved. We have the person evaluated. We see sort of what their mental state is. And then obviously, there's going to be some sort of treatment regimen. I, I would say the closest with. thing that we come to, okay, I'm just can't use the word come <laughs> to anything. The, the closest parallel I can draw in Maryland uh, for cases that we handle frequently are indecent exposure cases that are involved masturbation. Yeah. Um, and frankly, most of those people are people that suffer from mental illness. It's not, there's no funny sort of exhibitionism, but there usually ends up being some psychop- psychopathy there. But there is a, there is a far, in the same way that, that we always say that, that the individuals that are charged with, with possessing child pornography tend to be, have a different psychopathy than individuals who touch children. Not to say either of them are right, but they tend to be hmm. sort of different, different thought processes. Yes. Right. That here, I, I know that they're different, but you can't look at something like this. And, and I will tell you, I, I have represented someone for something like this, not this, that, that that person suffered from some pretty serious mental health issues. So you have to think there's something else there because you just don't do something like this. And you're probably competent. You're probably criminally responsible, but there's probably a whole lot going on upstairs and downstairs. That What do you guys think about 10 years? It is what it, I mean, I mean, you stab I, somebody with a fucking pretty, syringe. It's pretty horrific. It's a pretty horrific crime. I, I you know, I, it would be curious um, and interesting to know what his guidelines were. Um, if he had a prior criminal history, if he had prior contacts with the criminal yeah. justice system, because I think all of that would play into any, any sort of sentence. It also However, doesn't say if he had done it before or if he had done it multiple times. It, they, they found sort of five, they, that he's gonna yeah, try they found it. nine yeah. other empty syringes scattered throughout the house. Oh, some of them had liquid in them. Some of them were used. Some of them didn't have needles. So it sounds like there was like a before and an after, and there were several other victims. Yeah, and if the victims couldn't identify him or those grocery stores didn't have video. Also, you if, know, he, if he but does it's things have that are, sexually transmitted infection then potential mm-hmm. like that's even worse especially if he knows about it like well that's actually a different crime yeah depending on what disease you have well, there's, there's something but I, I'm, just saying, intentional I'm just saying transmission of a 
of AIDS is is a separate crime. Would it be more time in jail? Yes. Yes. There you go. Um, what was oh, I totally lost my train of thought on this one, and I had a Kurt's point. Oh, um, in terms of the mm-hmm. other potential victims that would not be able to identify him or you know the mo matches that's something that a prosecutor could in theory try to introduce at sentencing to add gravamen even though it's an unproven crime and of course as defense attorneys we would object we'd say it's not a proven crime um but typically the standard is lower it's it's more or less a relevancy standard in terms of you know what is an appropriate disposition in this case and you know the judge is going to want to hear those things like if you were arrested 27 times even if you were only convicted once it clearly shows a pattern of behavior where you're in the wrong place at the wrong time all yeah. you should also know that that judge mccormick it, it runs drug court right she's a former public defender and or she used to run drug court sorry but but for, you know she's a former public defender so not to say that that means that oh she would definitely you know be softer or or vice versa, but if you there have were mental somebody, health issues, she would have some general oh, 100, knowledge. A hundred percent. They're extremely reasonable. Yeah, I mean she's one. She's a judge that if you know you're in her courtroom, you know you can work a case out. I mean I it just as an interesting story, I had a very strange case where I had a I represented a young man who was in drug court, and one of his he kept having these violations in drug court. She took him into custody. And one of his dumbass friends, I didn't know this at the time, went on Instagram and said, let so-and-so out or, or I'm going to fucking burn the courthouse down. I didn't know that. And so I show up to court and there's all these sheriffs there and they pull me aside and we got a threat at the courthouse. And, you know, someone threatened about this case. And I call his buddies and I was like, did any of you do this? Right? No, 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 none of us did anything. And I was like, well, only so-and-so comes inside. And they're like, all right, so-and-so is going to come inside. And then the moment I mentioned so-and-so in the courtroom, they're like, that's who did the Instagram post. Oh, shit. And I'll tell you, the reason I bring this up is she still didn't hold that against the client. Yeah. So like the yeah. client's friend was dumb and it was an overt threat and they took the courthouse took it seriously. But the reason I know she's reasonable is even in that situation where you know, oh, maybe man. she was I remember when you called me, you were freaking the fuck out. I was, yeah. I mean, it's like my guy, my guy's in fucking drug court. It's like his friends, like, you lay so you had to burn down the courthouse. I'm like, what the, come on, man. Like, it's fucking drug court, dude. You're not burning down anything. Um, plus, being from PG County, they already burnt that courthouse down twice. So, like, uh, but she's very reasonable. I mean, she she's very prudent, she's very calculated. So, I mean, if, if she gave him 10 years, I don't want to say he probably deserved it, but he probably fucking deserved it. So, it definitely ha- well. This happened in Inner County, so it didn't quite happen in Baltimore. Happened in Baltimore Junior, but Baltimore it's adjacent. definitely happened. Isn't that what we call it? Baltimore, Baltimore adjacent. Baltimore. Yeah, Anne Arundel County or Guatemala or Guatemala, <laughs> south of Baltimore. All right, so now I have a. I can't believe it's not Baltimore Part Two. That is definitely not Baltimore. And for those of you who are avid listeners of our fine programming. We have mentioned this before, yes. and I was very excited to read this article. This is the third time very we've excited. done a variation of this kind. I of think this, this was, might be the best story. I think this was Gideon's one L uh, podcast <laughs> hypothetical. Yeah, Law, I, believe, Law, I believe that's one L exam question. Yeah. No, we sir, we did this first question. as yeah. what we used to do the educational segments, and it was what constitutes drunk driving. Right, and this came up as Una Hemplo. And then the second one was an actual story. And then we have... Now we have this one. Good. Which is from your hometown, Kurt? This is, in fact, from my hometown newspaper. It's his uncle. It is (laughs) not my uncle. (laughs) It's his fourth cousin by blood. Amish buggy driver facing DUI charges. An Amish teen is facing driving under the influence charges after an officer stopped his traveling horse and buggy and reportedly found him passed out inside, according to a police report. That's that alone, just excellent. He's, He's already shel- passed he out. He was sheltering, man. He was sheltering. We'll still, get to that. Still moving because the horse, the horse is smart. <laughs> a Westminster College public safety officer noticed, notified the police that he had passed a horse and buggy going westbound on uh, 129 Leesburg Station Road. What was the gentleman's name, Kurt? Uh, that he Enos stopped? S. Byler, who was 19. <laughs> and he saw the buggy going and the horse was just taking him home. The male driver appeared to be unconscious. A responding officer unsuccessfully tried to stop the horse and it continued with the passed out driver 
inside onto North Market Street through a flashing red signal because <laughs> he stopped. By the way, can going. I just tell you in this town? I mean, so they're smart, but they don't know Burrow, traffic laws. There are no, there's two traffic lights. Two, two. My buddy, this is where Aaron lives. God, this is so weird that you, is he on your, the, is the Byler side of the Knockman side of the family? I'm really confused. I actually used to have a girlfriend that went to Westminster. So pretty nice place. Well, it sounds like, I mean, the way this is written, it sounds like a high speed chase, but I don't imagine <laughs> that the horse is going that fast. I mean, the horse, they go like they're going 15, 20 miles. Yeah. The horse hour. also escaped from the rust, but there's set. not, there's no indication <laughs> that this horse is like at a gallop, right? I'm no. envisioning Enos. They, passed they usually out trot. and the horse is just trotting along yes. and the way this is written is like it blew through a flashing to... red light and swerved into oncoming traffic dude this which i imagine to be while a trotting. child on like a big wheel no this <laughs> this it said swerving into oncoming lane that no. swer- well, so, this horse okay, was so trucking. if you don't know anything about these bugs the bug you've seen the yeah, bugs yeah, before, yeah. right they're yeah. big they're not yeah, they're small big. yeah and the horses are all big too yeah so uh, a, a backup officer helped a uh, no this is great so backup officers show up and then another buggy driver helped the officer to stop the horse and buggy. He woke up the driver after several attempts, noting, noticing that he smelled of alcohol. The complaint said the paperwork also noted that Byler had a half case of Coors beer in the buggy and he had drank nine of them. According to his own admission, he agreed to a blood test, which uh, brought his blood alcohol content back at 0.16, more than double yeah, the sir. legal limit. He faces three counts of driving under the influence, including DUI as a minor, and one count of purchasing alcoholic beverages as a minor and disregarding a flashing red signal. Let me back you up there a little bit because you misspoke a bit. And I want to make sure he didn't disregard the flashing red signal. The horse did. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. He had no idea. It was like the equivalent of Michael Knight, right? It was (laughs) that was like kit the car. Like, you don't prosecute kit the car. Michael Knight's fault? No, that was total. That was definitely a Hasselhoff. I wanted to make sure, though, that our listeners are clear on this because this, I think, becomes a key part in the defense, right? Okay. You sort of yada yada, but it was a half case of Coors Light beer, not Coors Banquet beer, which I'm I'm calling bullshit. I mean. A half kit, you have to drink more than a half case of Coors Light to get to 0.16. You had to drink like 7,000 Coors Lights to get to 0.16. See, I'm glad that's where your it's head is. The goes. impossibility defense. It, it, <laughs> my head went to. Maybe he's very small. He's like very. You know, Enos he's is, a frail. He's, he's light, man. He's not a big Enos. Enos is like my size. I'm picturing the next buddy cop film being like crime in small town Pennsylvania. And the, it's a buddy cop drama where the buddy <laughs> cop is the Amish guy <laughs> that joins because they start having Amish crime and he has to go undercover. I like that the only way to stop Isn't the horse was Ford another movie? Amish guy. Yeah, that was Witness. So it's a mixture of like Witness and then the bowling movie with Woody Harrelson <laughs> and Kingpin, Ernie McCracken. Yes, Bigger Kingpin. McCracken. Yeah, yeah, so Randy that's Quaid. right. We're mixing. Yes, we're mixing that movie and Witness. <laughs> That's the next screen. Wait, Harrison okay. Ford made an Amish buddy cop movie? <laughs> no. <he didn't. laughs> Why do you guys ever tell me about that one? You want me to watch all these Nick Cage movies? Fuck that. I want to watch the it Harrison Ford Nick Cage Amish movie. buddy cop movie. We asked you to watch Con Air so you could learn about criminal law. Okay. <laughs> We, that's all we want. It's one Nick Cage movie. It's not a lot of Nick Cage movies. Yes, and you should watch. You should watch Ernie McCracken. It's an amazing movie with him and Woody Harrelson. Oh. So I have to say, um, <laughs> oh God, I can't. know. I was, oh. uh, I was thinking about the show the other day, and I was thinking about our new format. What show? This show? This show? Yeah, this show. And <laughs> you mean I, people give thought, put thought into this show ahead of time? Only Kurt and I. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. And so I was thinking about the show and I was thinking about our new format. We're live every Friday. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many of our listeners are our real listeners, all one of them. <laughs> how many of them lament the lack of the second episode lawyers on the rocks? Where we used to um oh, right. used to go we off the rails. It was a, a side and the B side, man. Yeah. Yeah. And um, every odd episode was a little drunker than the even episodes, right? So I know we've we've been live here for a little longer than usual, and and our intrepid what? podcast assistant 
bartender has supplied us with a second drink. Yeah, by I, the way, we've I'm getting some I'm getting some shadows of episode two here as we as we come to the end. Well, of can this. I just say so we've had like two comments, one from Clarissa's mom <laughs> and the other one from our old colleague, Dave Kessler. Was Clarissa's mom so like, saying, can you let Clarissa go home? Yeah, basically. Yeah. And like, are you paying are you her overtime? Her, right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, we don't have listener listener Katie. She's Hold on. Did you say today. Dave Kessler? Dave Kessler. I did. Say oh, Dave dude. Kessler. What's I know we got nice. a big shout out. Where's right? Peter? Is Peter? We like, should listen to Peter's not Where's here. Peter? Yeah, David Where's Kessler Steve should Marino. be doing like a fucking he should be doing like helping Gideon with doing the intro and the outro. Yeah, he should he, give us a little piano. He's, there. He, his twinkle twinkle. What do, you, what do you call it? I don't know. I don't know. Twinkling the ivories. Twink, tickle, tickling the ivories. Tickling. He's not a brilliant twinkling piano, the piano player and twinkling, lawyer. Twinkling, yeah. twinkling the ivories is a crime, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, is that, did steam and semen do that that's, one too? Yeah, that's why I got 10 years. <laughs> should we say it? Should we just throw all caution to the wind and do this last story? What, what this, I thought this was the best story. Oh, Oof, man. We're in an hour. I don't know. Oh, It'll yeah. be too long, I think. Oh, yeah. Tune in next yeah. time. Let's do it. Let's so, go all the way there, guys. So we have a great topic that we're going to table all until right, next Let's week. And next week, we are going to discuss Chinese man killed in an elaborate body swapping scheme. Hold on. And Peter's not on with us right now. No, I mean, Peter's not on. So we, oh, need we can't do it. I knew it. Yeah, we can't we do it. He we sent do us it. it. This, is, this his, is his alibi. It's, it's a biography. <laughs> 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 He's going to hate me for that. I know. You I'm know, never going to hear the end of that one. Well, I, thank you for joining us on Abogados de los Piedras. Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Lawyers on the Rocks. We hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed making. Special shout out what are we to making? Chef Ray. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. At Heritage Kitchen. Please go check him out. He is, where's what's the name of the mill? Whitehall. Whitehall. Mill. Whitehall Mill Clipper on mill 3300 Road. Clipper Mill Road. Please go check him out. I'm going to go check him out uh, next weekend, probably if I can. Jeremy will as well. And we're going to have a good time. It's going to be awesome. Until the next time, sit back, relax, pour yourself a drink. Until the next Lawyers on the Rocks. They could people.